Hey guys, Kenna here with day one of protein synthesis, looking at the first half process known as transcription. So what are today's essential questions? Well, number one, where does transcription take place? If you think about where DNA is stored, you probably can answer this question already. Question two, what are the similarities between introns and exons? Now this process, we're gonna go over for three class periods. And as we go through this, I want you to pay attention to what happens in each half, transcription and translation, but also be keeping an eye on the bigger picture for the entire process of protein synthesis. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Protein synthesis is the process by which the organism produces proteins. Remember that all living organisms need proteins to go ahead and allow their chemical reactions to take place. Those chemical reactions are going to be only possible because the lowered activation energy because of the existence of proteins. Proteins do a lot of different things, however. They're also structural. They're also going to be involved as hormones. They help with communication. They help with cell transport. The list goes on and on. But when we start thinking about this, hopefully you remember we talked about an organelle that goes ahead and actually makes proteins. Do you guys remember what that is? That's right, it's the ribosome. Now we're not gonna get quite to the ribosome today, but in order to know what to build, the ribosome needs instructions. And we're gonna go ahead and start with the first part of the process, transcription. Next class, we will go ahead and focus on translation and then we'll get a better idea of the whole process in total. Now, DNA is stored inside the nucleus, inside what are known as chromosomes. And those chromosomes are wound up genes or genetics. They are supercoiled, and so the first thing we have to do in order to be able to go ahead and copy a particular gene is to unwind and unzip that DNA double helix because the instructions that we need are coded in the bases that are found as the ladder rungs inside the double helix. Remember the outer bars are the sugar phosphate backbone and the inner steps of the ladder, if you will, are the bases themselves, which is what we're going to be focusing on. Now, in order to actually access the DNA to be able to get to that portion, we're gonna have to unwind it. And the DNA is protected in addition to the double helix itself, by winding itself self up even further in what are known as supercoils around histone proteins. So again, just one more job that proteins perform. So DNA is wrapped tightly around these histones and has to be uncoiled in those chromosomes to be able to get to the actual bases so that we can go ahead and make our copy. And each strand of the original DNA is going to serve as a template for the new strand when we're doing DNA replication. But today we're gonna to go ahead and focus on transcription, which is gonna copy only one side of the DNA double helix. Now a single sequence of DNA will end up producing a single protein. And that's probably one of the more important things that you need to make sure that you take away from today is that when we start talking about DNA and how it makes proteins, one gene equals one protein, okay? That's a really important thing to kind of keep in mind. One gene equals one protein. Let's make that a little bigger, okay? One gene equals one protein. Now, when we're going ahead and doing this, there may be a thousand or more bases in just one gene. The sequence of nucleotides is read in groups of three called triplets. And so when we talk about like a reading frame, if you read a word, a word can vary in length from one letter up to I don't know, 12 letters or more. But when we start thinking about this in terms of DNA, every word, if you will, is written in a group of three bases, okay? What we call a triplet. And when we get through these triplets, they create a sequence that is known as the genetic code. 
So as mentioned before, the code is written in groups of three. A group of three bases, known as a triplet, controls the production of a particular amino acid at the ribosome of the cell. But we got to get to the ribosome first. Now, one of the things I want you to kind of keep in mind as we go through this is that the DNA is stored where? If you said the nucleus, you're right. Now, let's use an analogy to help you understand why that's so important. Let's say that you're going to go ahead and build a new family home for you and your family. Okay? When you do that, the first thing you want to do is you want to have, I don't know, blueprints drawn up so that you know exactly what the house is going to look like. And the construction workers have a plan for how to build what it is that you want. That way you get what you want. Now, once you draw out those plans and have them ready to go, do you just hand them over to the construction workers, the ones that are actually on site doing the work? You probably don't want to, not because they can't be trusted, but they all have different jobs to do. And so everybody kind of needs their own copy. So what you end up doing so that nothing happens to the original is that you make a copy of the parts needed by different parts, by different workers, and you give them a copy of the original, not the original itself. Well, your body does the exact same thing. It makes a copy of the original, and then it sends that copy out to the ribosome to make that particular protein. So the different amino acids that will build the protein and the order in which they are joined up determines the type of protein being produced, what job it performs, and where it's going to belong in the cell. Just like we talked about earlier in this term, there's a strong relationship between structure and function. Okay, so the DNA is producing these little triplets or codes of three that are read as part of a gene which will produce a single protein. Again, one gene equals one protein. So how do we get the instructions from the DNA that we don't want to risk losing, which are protected and stored there inside the vault of the nucleus, out to where they need to go? Now, in DNA, the group of three bases is known as a triplet. And that triplet is going to be copied into an RNA, and in specific, an mRNA triplet, which is known as a codon. And every triplet codes for a specific amino acid. So if we were to go ahead and stop and look at a particular sequence, we can actually start looking at this in terms of triplets. If this is my sequence, G, C, A, C, A, A, C, C, A, C, C, A, G, C, T, G, 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 A, G, C, C, A, you'll notice that it's all broken out in groups of three. Now, we know that this is a triplet and not a codon because it includes the base thymine. Remember that T, or thymine, is only found in DNA. In RNA, whether it's mRNA, tRNA, rRNA, it is going to include a U or uracil instead of the T for thymine. Now, one of the things we're going to start looking at is what we call a codon wheel. You are going to convert the DNA by matching base pairs into RNA, and then the RNA, mRNA in particular, can be used on the codon wheel to give you a particular amino acid. In this particular instance, the amino acids are alanine, valine, glycine, glycine, arginine, proline, leucine, and glycine. They're joined together in a correct sequence based on the bases in DNA to make that particular section of the protein. Now, you may remember when we were first introducing you to all of our different macromolecules that we talked about how important the DNA is in terms of instructions, but the fact that DNA itself doesn't do a whole lot, but instead makes proteins, which do a lot of the actual heavy lifting. So DNA is found in the nucleus and copied into a single strand instruction set called RNA, in particular mRNA, which then leaves the nucleus and builds the protein in the cytoplasm at the ribosome. The RNA code is complementary to what is copied, but it's not identical to the nuclear DNA. Okay, so you have to kind of keep this in mind. We've got this 
coding where it's complementary, not where it's actually an exact copy. So the proteins build the cell structures. They also make the enzymes, but the DNA controls which enzymes are made and the enzymes determine what reactions take place. So we have this whole cascade of events where the DNA has the instructions to build the proteins and then the proteins tell the body essentially what to do and do the work to make it happen. The structures and reactions in the cell are completely determined by what type of cell it is and what its function is. And those jobs are carried out by the proteins. So DNA exerts its control on the cell through the proteins that it produces. Now remember, when we were doing our nucleic acids worksheet, RNA is a single-stranded molecule, and we've replaced thymine with uracil, okay? So at this point, I would like you to go ahead and take some space in your notes and take a look at the codon wheel that's attached to this set of notes, okay? I'm gonna give you a small imaginary protein here, and we're gonna start thinking about how we convert from DNA to mRNA and eventually to our amino acids. Now, I'm gonna build an imaginary protein, but this protein is, it's not gonna be a full protein. It's gonna be smaller than most proteins by a, quite a bit. And I'm gonna limit myself to only five different amino acids to determine this particular shape and molecule. So you can see we've got serine and cysteine and valine and glycine and serine and cysteine and alanine and valine. And some of them, the cysteines in particular, you'll notice, have another bridge going between them. This is a bond, and this is typically what we would call a disulfide bond, okay? It's, it's got sulfur in it that's gonna go ahead and hold it together. If you remember the elements that are found in our proteins, chomps, right? Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And proteins are the only ones that really have that sulfur in it, and it's in these bonds. So each amino acid, whether it's serine, cysteine, valine, glycine, alanine, you name it, is coded for by a very specific or particular group of bases. And this is going to be based, if you remember our movie on the history of DNA, on what's known as Chargaff's rule. So according to Chargaff's rule, A binds to T, and C binds to G. That's the only way it works in DNA. We're gonna use a modified version of Chargaff's rule to help us base pair the RNA. And so it's gonna have the same combinations, but remember thymine is replaced with uracil. We're still gonna read in groups of three. We're going from a DNA triplet, so three nucleotides, to an RNA triplet known as a codon still three nucleotides. Each codon codes for a very specific amino acid, which you can start seeing on your codon wheel. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. DNA controls the cell function by serving as a template or set of instructions for the protein structure. So let's go ahead and take a look at your codon wheel. Here's your first example. We're gonna go ahead and take a look at this particular triplet. Now we know it's a triplet because it's got thymine down at the bottom. So we know this is in DNA. And your codon wheel is codons, which means it's written in mRNA. So if you've printed a copy of this out for yourself, I would encourage you to write at the top mRNA above the word codon. Okay, put it in parentheses or something. If you don't have a printout copy, you might wanna copy this down somewhere in your notes. Okay, we've got cytosine, adenine, and thymine. Cytosine, C, is going to bind, according to Chargaff's rule, to G, guanine. Okay, so find guanine on your codon wheel. Adenine is going to bind to T, thymine, if we were in DNA. But remember, we're copying from DNA to RNA. So instead of thymine, we're going to use what? That's right, uracil, okay? So cytosine binds to guanine, adenine in this case binds to uracil. What does thymine bond to? Hopefully you said adenine. 
Now, this is where a lot of people make a mistake. A lot of people think, well, thymine is going to go to uracil because we're an RNA. You're thinking the right thing, but in the wrong place. Thymine is going to bond to adenine because there is adenine in RNA. It's the adenine above that binds with uracil that is the change because there is no thymine in RNA. Now, if you go ahead and start in the middle of your codon wheel, begin with guanine, G, and then switch to uracil, U, moving outward, and then go ahead and A, adenine, so G, U, A, and if you look out next to it, what does it say for the amino acid? That's right, valine, okay? So let's try another one. We've got cytosine, C binds with G, guanine, G binds with C, and adenine, A binds with, good, with U for uracil. So we can now use our codon wheel to help us predict what the amino acid is based on the mRNA code, codons. All right, so let's do a quick review again of DNA versus RNA. In DNA, we've got adenine and thymine. Notice that they bond together. Whoops, too fast and cytosine and guanine. Now remember there are two factors that dictate how they bond. Okay, One is their shape. You always have a purine and a pyrimidine. The other is the number of hydrogen bonds. One pair has two hydrogen bonds. The other has three. And everything is the same except for the fact that we've replaced thymine with uracil. Okay, In RNA, uracil replaces thymine. So both DNA and RNA are in this category of macromolecules known as nucleic acids, and therefore is made up of the monomer nucleotides. Like the structure of DNA, RNA has a sugar phosphate backbone, but instead of the sugar being deoxyribose, like DNA, it uses the sugar ribose, still a five carbon sugar. And in place of thymine, one of our nitrogenous bases, Okay, in this case, it's a single ring base, so a pyrimidine. Thymine is replaced by uracil. Now, there are three typical types of RNA that you will hear about. The first one is what we're going to talk about the most today and how we do our copying, and that's messenger RNA or mRNA. Now, messenger is used because it is transporting the message from the DNA in the nucleus to the ribosome where it's going to go ahead and actually produce the protein. So this is the part that leaves the nucleus and goes to the ribosome. So messenger RNA or mRNA. Ribosomal RNA or rRNA is found as part of the structure of the ribosome and helps to line things up so it's easier to copy the mRNA into amino acids. The last one we have here is transfer RNA or tRNA. Kind of looks like a T. That's a good way to help you remember it. So tRNA has the amino acid attached to it. This amino acid is specific to the triplet on the tRNA, which is going to match up to the triplet in the mRNA. Okay, and we're going to talk more about this as we go through the different steps. But those are the three main types of RNA that you should know messenger RNA or mRNA, which is the one we're going to focus on today, ribosomal RNA or rRNA, which is found as part of the structure of the ribosome, and transfer RNA or tRNA, which actually brings the amino acids into the ribosome. So let's do a quick overview of the process of photosynthesis. And today I'm only going to give you the transcription portion because that's what we're going to go ahead and focus on here. So we're going to make a copy of the DNA into messenger RNA or mRNA, which will then be sent out of the nucleus to the ribosome. Okay, that's the process of transcription. Now, remember, where do we store the DNA? Hopefully you said the nucleus. That makes sense because why? Hopefully because you want to protect those original instructions and only send out a copy for when you're making your protein. So when we go ahead and take a look at transcription, we are going to start by step one, OK? 
Okay, first thing you always are gonna have to do is to, oh, that's pretty big. Let's make that a little bit smaller. That'll work. Unwind and unzip. Okay, this should be our first step because remember the DNA is coiled up and we need to get into these bases that are in the center so in order for us to do that, we have to take the big molecule of DNA and we have to unwind it and then break those hydrogen bonds, unzip it to actually gain access to the nucleotide bases, okay? Now, when we make this, we're gonna copy what's known as the template strand. And the enzyme that does this is RNA polymerase. So you might wanna go ahead and highlight this for yourself. Okay, so this is a key thing to know. RNA polymerase is what does the copying of DNA into RNA. And the strand of DNA that it copies, if you remember from our worksheet we did, is the DNA template strand. And as you go through, it's going to do bonding according to a modified version of Chargaff's rule, copying a to C, I mean, A to U instead of T, because T is gone, remember, and C to G. G to C, and T will bond to A, okay? Now, it only can read in one direction, and I'm not going to go into great detail about three prime to five prime, but essentially, there are chemical designations for a particular direction, and RNA polymerase and later DNA polymerase, which we'll talk about later, can only copy in a single direction. So when we go ahead and start thinking about this, remember that we have these key vocab words that we need to highlight. Step one, DNA has to unwind and unzip. We need to be able to do that in order to actually access the nucleotide bases and the DNA and RNA are both nucleo nucleic acids, and so therefore are both formed from nucleotides. The difference is RNA is single-stranded, DNA is double-stranded. We're gonna copy the DNA into RNA, but we're gonna go ahead and replace thymine with uracil, okay? Remember this takes place inside the nucleus because we don't want the DNA to leave the nucleus because we want to protect it and keep it safe. Therefore, we make a copy of the gene that we need in the form of our mRNA, which is going to be sent out of the nucleus and down to the ribosome, okay? This is the process of transcription. So inside the nucleus, and I know you're probably getting me tired of me repeating myself, but this is the best way to remember it. We have RNA polymerase, which is an important protein that's going to copy the DNA strand, the template strand, into the messenger RNA, okay? It can only read one direction, and as it copies, it's gonna build the new nucleic acid, this time RNA, using ribose instead of deoxyribose, and replacing thymine with uracil, okay? Now, before we can do any of this copying, remember the first step is always to go ahead and unwind and unzip, all right? Unwind and unzip. Now, it would be nice if that were it, and that was as simple as it gets, and that was all done. But there's actually one more thing that has to happen. When we make that copy of the DNA molecule into the RNA for that particular gene, it's not exactly what we need to copy. Instead, there are some pieces that need to be cut out. These are leftover parts from evolution over many years. And so we have two different parts of the gene. We have the segments that are coding or expressed. And then we have the interrupted or intervening pieces, which are non-coding sequences. Now, I want to highlight this. And one of the reasons for that is that the terminology that they use seems quite backwards to what we've done so far. Every time we've talked about this idea of X, right? XO, outer, we usually think of exon as out. So it might be tempting to think of exons as being the things that get cut out. 
And every time we've talked about inter, it's tempting to say kept in. It even says that in the beginning of the word, in trance. But in actuality, this is not what they've chosen in terms of the terminology. Exons are those that are expressed. So these are kept in. Versus introns, which are going to be intervening, <clears throat> these are the ones that are cut out. Okay, so exons are expressed, kept in, and introns are intervening. These are the ones that are cut out. Now, we're not going to go into detail about what the purpose is of the introns and what they may have historically done as well, but for our purposes, we're going to cut out the introns, stitch together the exons, and that will be the final RNA transcript that will be ready to ship out to the ribosome. Okay, so again, exons are expressed, they're kept in, and introns are intervening sequences, which are going to be cut out. So if this is our original DNA, we've got a mix and match of exons and introns, okay? We're going to start by doing transcription, which is going to go ahead and make a copy of the DNA into RNA, in particular, messenger RNA. It's going to do that using RNA polymerase, which can only read one direction, and that's going to replace deoxyribose with the sugar ribose and it's gonna replace thymine with uracil. But we just said that we're not done there. There's one more step that we have to do. What do we keep? What do we cut out? Hopefully you remember the weird terminology. This seems backwards from what we've learned so far, but exons are those that are expressed. They're the ones that are kept. And the introns are the pieces that are going to be cut out. They're the intervening sequences. Now your body doesn't waste anything. Those introns are then going to be recycled and broken down so that we can go ahead and reuse the pieces later. But that messenger RNA or mRNA is then going to go to the ribosome and actually manufacture the protein. All right. All right. So let's go over the entire process again. Okay. Transcription is the first half of protein synthesis, and it takes place in the nucleus. Step one, we have to unwind and unzip the DNA double helix. We do this so that we can get at the nucleotide bases, which is what we're actually trying to copy. It's in the nucleus because the DNA never leaves the nucleus because we wanna protect the DNA so that it doesn't get damaged because this is the instructions for everything that the cell does. The copying of the DNA molecule is gonna happen with RNA polymerase and it's gonna copy DNA into the initial RNA transcript from the template strand creating codon triplets. So remember a group of three in DNA is called a triplet and a group of three in mRNA is going to be called a codon. The codon is what we're going to use when we use our codon wheel to go ahead and determine what type of amino acid, which is in proteins, that we're going to end up with. Before we can build that protein, we have to start by editing the RNA transcript, keeping the, that's right, exons, and cutting out the introns, even though the terminology seems a little bit backwards. Okay, so let's do a quick overview and kind of preview what we're gonna be looking at next class. So protein synthesis is made up of two parts, transcription, which we focused on today, and translation, which we will focus on next class. Transcription takes place in the nucleus because that DNA never leaves there. We wanna keep it protected. Step one is to what? That's right, unwind and unzip. We unwind and unzip the double helix and then we're going to make a copy. What's making the copy? Good, RNA polymerase, okay? RNA polymerase is gonna copy in one direction and it's gonna go ahead and build an 
mRNA molecule, a transcript. But as it does so, it's going to replace the deoxyribose with ribose, and it's going to replace the thymines with uracil. Remember that mRNA, all RNAs actually, are single-stranded. And then when we go ahead and make this, we're not quite done. We still have to edit that mRNA transcript to get the final transcript that's ready to ship out to the ribosome. As we edit it, we're going to keep in which parts? That's right, exons. Exon means expressed or kept in. And we're going to cut out the introns, which are intervening sequences that are cut out. We now have our final mRNA transcript, which is ready to leave the nucleus through the nuclear pore and head to the ribosome where the protein will actually be made. Okay, so next class, we're going to look at translation and we're going to take that messenger RNA and we're going to use it to produce proteins. So remember, part one, transcription, takes place in the nucleus because that's where the DNA is found, and we want to protect the DNA so that it doesn't get damaged. Once we make our copy of the DNA into mRNA and edit that mRNA, it's that final mRNA transcript that's going to be sent out of the nucleus through the nuclear pore and go ahead and head to the ribosome where the second half of the process or translation is going to occur. And that's what we'll go ahead and cover next class. Okay, guys. So that's what I've got for you today. Uh, we got some practice with this uh, tomorrow. And then we'll go ahead and start getting the whole process in mind and start doing some of this protein synthesis and making sure we understand how to do the modified Chargas rule to do some base pairing. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Talk to you soon. Take care.